Basilius as speakers in this uh, conference. We also we have with us Abuna Bshui Abba Musa, the vicar for uh, Florida. I pray that all of us we will benefit from this uh, convention and the topics that we will listen to it uh, during this weekend. Uh, we'll speak tonight about how the Coptic Church is bridging the gap here in, uh, in America and what is the vision for the Coptic Church in the future. Uh, if you think about it, Coptic Church, we can consider it as immigrant church to America and uh, want actually to adapt to uh, the American culture in order to be able to serve uh, the Americans as well as the new generations, the second, third, fourth generation who are born here in America. And many studies were done about uh, immigration in general. And although most of these studies are done uh, regarding uh, individuals, but as we will see, we can apply these studies on the church itself, and we can benefit from, uh, from these studies in how the church bridge the culture and bridge the gap between the two cultures. And uh, if you think about what are the challenges uh, when a church immigrates from home country to a host country, the main two challenges are the language and the culture. Language and culture. Uh, and actually, St. Paul, when he spoke about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, he spoke about the importance of uh, speaking the same language, 
if I speak in tongue and you don't understand my tongue, then how, when I give thanks, you will say Amen. So he spoke about the language, and also he spoke about how you will be, you can become foreigner to me, or I become foreigner to you, uh, and this also about the culture. So the, these are the two main issues, language and culture. So, first, what is the definition of culture? Because many times, it is a very fine line between what we consider culture and what we consider uh, as uh, tradition, holy tradition of the church, or canons of the church, or rights of the church. What's culture? Culture consists of socially acquired information through beliefs, values, knowledge, idea, which impact my behavior and attitude, especially in the family setting. Uh, and a change from a familiar environment, like the church, the Coptic church, is an Egyptian church. So when actually the Coptic church started here in America, the there is a change from a familiar environment to unfamiliar environment. So we will speak about how the church adapt and how we adapt differently to a new culture. Uh, Culture, it is the shared attitudes, values, principles, goals, and practices that characterizes a group. Culture is something in which we are immersed in without being conscious of it. And we assimilate the culture by osmosis, not by instruction, not by somebody comes and tell me, you are Egyptian culture, here is one, two, three, you need to do this. No, just growing in American culture, growing in Egyptian culture, you will absorb and assimilate this culture, and it will be like your nature, your, your nature. And we tend to accept cultural values without thinking of them, without thinking of them. The church immigrated here because people immigrated. When, back in the 60s, when His Holiness Pope Kirillus found that Egyptians start to immigrate from Egypt to uh, America and Canada, he started sending priests to serve them. Understanding why people immigrate actually help the church uh, serving these people better. And what is the reasons of immigration? Pressure, discrimination against Christian, insecurity in the home culture. For example, after the revolution in 2012, the wave of immigration increased because people felt insecure. And after many cops were killed and martyred in Egypt, people started to consider immigrating and leaving Egypt. Some people immigrate just they are seeking better life. People come here just with work or for study. People come here for marriage. For example, if an American person married an Egyptian girl, you know, so she immigrated here just to be with her husband. The lottery, many people just apply to the lottery and get immigration. Some people come here for treatment. For example, if they have a child with special need, they say he will get better treatment here. Some people came just to join the rest of the family. For example, maybe members of my family immigrated here, so the rest of the family want to uh, immigrate in order to be together. Some people just 
came here as part of their travel and they liked the culture, so they decided to stay. Uh, dissatisfaction. Some people are dissatisfied with their uh, home culture, that's why they are seeking uh, satisfaction in another culture. Some of us, like me myself, I just came here for service. I never thought about immigration or to leave Egypt, but I was instructed to go and serve the people here, so I just came here, I came here for the sake of the service. When people immigrate, and when the church immigrate, a process called adaptation and acculturation start. And adaptation is the degree of change that occurs when the church or the individual moves from a familiar culture to unfamiliar culture. For example, in Egypt, we never prayed in English. Here we are praying in English. That's part of adaptation. We are adapting to this new culture. It is a gradual transformation process, and it doesn't happen overnight. And some people actually they are trying to push uh, the adaptation, but it doesn't work this way. Adaptation and acculturation takes time. It's a gradual transformation. And it is influenced by many factors, including environmental factors, factors related to the host culture, which here will be America, and individual expectation and motivation. When some of our children, they are pushing uh, to Americanize the culture of the church, one time I told them, I think you are like a couple waiting for a baby for a long time. And then the wife became pregnant. So they are not waiting for the full term. They just excited now she is pregnant, so they want actually to have her baby after one month or two months. Uh, but this actually will result in what? In miscarriage, and the baby will die. That's why we need to wait for the gradual transformation. So this baby, uh, the, the church that is, will be adapted to this culture, sh should actually finish the full term in order to have a strong church. Uh, and usually, as it happened in the scripture, there are two dominant groups, two, two groups, a dominant group and a non-dominant group. Like in the beginning of Christianity, Christianity started among the Jews. And the Jews here was the dominant group. And the Gentile were the undominant group. So a conflict happened between Jews and Gentiles. And the Jews actually want what we call Judaizers. They want actually to impose the Jewish tradition on the Gentiles. And St. Paul went through difficult time with the Judaizers. And the first council, uh, council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 was to address this issue. So usually there is a conflict between the dominant group and the non-dominant group. Like in the Coptic church here in America in the beginning, the dominant group was the immigrant who came from Egypt. So it is Egyptian culture. That's why if Americans join the church, that is the non-dominant group, that is the minority group here. And there was a conflict or a crisis. Now in the churches, when the most of the congregation are new generation or Americans, when Egyptian newcomers go to this church, they will be the non-dominant group. And usually there is a crisis or a conflict happening between the two groups. Crisis can end by separation, which that is actually uh, the wrong uh, outcome or the undesired outcome. 
or ends by adaptation by one or both of the groups. So they start to adapt and change in order to uh, accept one another and live in harmony with one another. And they describe the stages of adaptation, which actually applies for individual as well as for the churches. The person goes through four churches, uh, four stages. The first stage we call it honeymoon stage. What is the honeymoon stage? Like, I, I want to immigrate to America. I'm speaking here about individual, and then I'll speak about churches. I want to immigrate to America. So once I got the visa, I'll be happy. I, I, I think my dream is fulfilled. And actually, the honeymoon stage, uh, I'm looking for a better life. And uh, once I get the stamp of immigration on my passport, I feel that my honeymoon started. And I believe that all my problems are now resolved. I can live a very happy life, and the dream is fulfilled right now. In the same way, when the church established, uh, the Coptic church established a church like in America, or in Brazil, or in Bolivia, or in Kenya, we become very happy. Now we have a church outside uh, Egypt. Now we have a church in Brazil. Now we have a church in Bolivia. And now we have a church in America. You know? So that is the honeymoon stage. But Unfortunately, the honeymoon stage doesn't last long. Then we we'll go to the second stage, which is the hostility stage. What's hostility stage? That's what we call culture shock. A struggle for to fit in. We find language barriers and uh, uh, homesickness. Uh, for individuals, we find uh, somebody, for example, practicing medicine in Egypt for so many years, and when he comes here, they don't accept him as actually a technician. And he has to study and take qualified exams. That's why we call it a uh, um, hostility stage. It's not uh, an easy transition. And the person will start to discover that his dreams is not fulfilled. He, he will start from zero, or sometimes under zero. Financial obligation, expenses. And the same for the church. Uh, resources, we don't have resources. And to, to, to be able to build a church, to be able to uh, find uh, a support, uh, it's very challenging. I remember Abuna Moros, uh, Moros in Toronto, who was actually the first priest came to North America by His Holiness Pope uh, Kirillus. He shared with us a story, and it is actually a public story, so I'm not revealing the confidential information here. <laughs> but when he came actually to uh, Canada, uh, and after uh, about uh, one month, so the congregation said to Abu Namorus, uh, they were actually 30 families, only 30 families. So they told him, we appreciate your effort, and we appreciate the love of Pope Krellos, who sent you here to serve us. But unfortunately, we cannot afford uh, your salary. We cannot afford to have a church here. So we will send a letter to Pope Krellos that you go back to Egypt and uh, we, we will pray in any Orthodox church here. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot have a Coptic church here because we cannot afford it. And uh, after actually uh, they met and made this decision, Abu Namoros spent one night actually in prayer. Uh, and he doesn't want this seed of the Coptic church in North America to die. So after a whole night in prayer, so God gave him an idea. So he called the congregation the following day and told them, I have an idea. Let me see whether it is acceptable for you or not. 
And this was the idea. Abu Namur is married, and at that time, he had a little baby. So he told them, you are 30 families. So if you can host us for one night a month. So every day you will move from a family to another family to another family to spend this night in your house. Me, my wife, and my baby. And thus, I don't need a salary and just can provide for our food and that's it. And I, I, I will serve you for free. And when the people actually, can you imagine how difficult it is for a young couple with a baby to every night to move from house to house? So when the people actually saw the determination of Abu Namurus, how actually he determined to serve them on the expense of his convenience, on the expense of you know, his family, uh, they said, you know what, Abuna? No. God willing, there will be a church here, and you will not move from house to house. Uh, God will provide. And the church started. Uh, when I remember this story, and I see how now, for example, before ordaining a priest, the priest has all what he needs. Uh, I remember what the Lord said. Others labored, and we uh, came uh, upon uh, or after their, uh, their labor. أخرون تعبوا أنتم تخلتم على تعبوا. Yes, other came, يعني, and they started here uh, through. It, it was a very difficult time for them, but through their determination, through their patience, through their uh, sacrifice, the commitment to serve. Uh, that's why ha that's how the Coptic Church started here in America, and we should not forget this history. This history actually is very important to know. Now we have churches, and we, we start to argue and negotiate about what the church should be and what should look like, and we forget how people actually labored very hard and went through a difficult time in order to have a Coptic church in North America. Uh, the third, uh, and also, uh, during the hostility stage, there is identity struggle. Am I American or am I Egyptian? And the conflict is between parents and children. You are, uh, children say to the parents, you are Egyptian, you are American. Parents say, say to the children, no, you are Egyptian and you will be Egyptian. So this caused a lot of conflict. And we can see it also in the church, for example, uh, the congregation, especially the uh, second generation, third generation, go to Abuna and say, Abuna Egyptian, well, you cannot serve us this way, you are American, we want the church to be this way, and a lot of tension sometimes happens between the uh, young generation and uh, the priest, especially if the priest came from Egypt or he grew up in Egypt. The third stage, we call it the humor stage. Uh, why we call it humor? Because now this hostility is gone, and people are relaxed, and actually they can share their cultural and language mistake. All of us, when we came here, we made cultural and language mistakes, uh, and we can laugh about our mistakes. We are not embarrassed to share uh, our mistakes. And with this stage, there is some uh, adaptation uh, or adjustment to the society. Uh, so they are comfort in the new culture. Uh, there is no embarrassment that I am from a different culture. Uh, there is career security, understanding myself. I have insight about the culture. I have a place to worship. Uh, so it is a person start to adjust to a new society. And many people and many churches when they reach this stage, they feel they are uh, done with adaptation and acculturation. Uh, but no, there is another stage which actually is a very important stage, that what we call home stage. Home stage. What's the home stage? Home stage, when the home expand to include the host culture 
as well as the home culture. And there is a sense of belonging to the host culture. And as a church, usually we, uh, we are not only interested in what's happening in Egypt, but also are interested in what's happening in America. And we consider America is part of our identity. The sense of whom is not only Egyptian, but I feel I am Egyptian-American. American and Egyptian in the same way. That is a new perception of my identity. Uh, and here there is a better understanding of diversity. Uh, and there is no discrimination here. Uh, neither the American discriminate against the Egyptian or Egyptian discriminate against the American. And also there is a sense of patriotism toward the American uh, culture as well as our uh, home culture, which is Egypt. Uh, and if you are saying we are Egyptian, they the American, then you, you did not reach yet the home culture because you don't perceive yourself as American. If you perceive yourself as American, you will not say the, the American, but we the Egyptian because you should perceive yourself as also as an American. And also, that's how the church should perceive itself. A church here, sometimes we differentiate this American church, it's not American church, but actually all the churches here should be American churches, because we are here in America. If we distinguish between Amer uh, churches, this American Coptic and this just the Coptic, actually this distinguishes is not right. All churches here should be American churches. And that's why I'm questioning, should we add the word American for example, when you go to Egypt, you don't find St. Anthony Egyptian Church. Well, no, it's Egyptian Church. It's in Egypt. Yeah. So why here we say St. Mark American Church? What in America? It has to be American <laughs> Church. Right? So nobody says, you know, but that's how it goes right now. <laughs> so. Identif so identify yourself. I'm speaking here about the immigrants, not about the new generation or the American. Uh, I can see myself as Egyptian and American. It is funny sometimes when I'm praying in a church and, uh, uh, for example, a deacon comes to me and says, Sayyidna, Sayyidna, there are foreigners here. Some American came into the church. <laughs> so they are called foreigners in their own country. <laughs> And I left, who is a foreigner here? Is it us or them? <laughs> but that's how we perceive the American in America. We are foreign. <laughs> uh, so, in the home stage, we develop a sense of belonging to this culture. And we don't call it host culture anymore. It is home culture for me. Uh, uh, so, America is my country. It's not anymore a host country for me. Uh, and I perceive myself as Egyptian as well as American. Uh, and unless the immigrants know the home stage, because as I told you, some of us when we reach the human stage, we feel we are done with adaptation. But unless we know the home stage and are aware of this final stage, we will remain stuck either in human human stage or some of us are stuck in the hostility stage. St. Paul, when he started to travel and serve, he came to this conclusion when he said, there is no Jew or Greek, there is no barbarian or uh, Scythian. So now in the Church of Christ, all of us, there is unity among this uh, diversity. And I like when I read in the book of Revelation, how it describes uh, heaven from every tongue, from every tribe, from every nation. That's why I say the church here is an icon of heaven. So the church should be multicultural. If it is a real icon of heaven, so the church should include people from every culture. Because all of us are brothers and sisters. All of us are children of Adam and Eve. So we go beyond the discrimination. Yes, we come from different background, uh, but there is unity amongst all of us. Uh, 
And if the immigrants resist the new generation or the American to be part of their church, that's wrong. And also, the, the, the opposite is wrong. If the Americans, they are not welcoming the Egyptian to be part of their church, that's also wrong. Uh, and here, we need actually understand the unity and diversity. Yes, we have different background, different cultures, but in Christ, all of us, we eat from one bread, the body of Christ. We drink from one cup, the chalice of the blood of Christ. So, so all of us, we are one. Uh, that's why they uh, divide the, Ameri the immigrants, and this also apply for the churches. They divide them into four groups based on their attitude toward the host culture, US, and the home culture, Egypt here. So, I, I, I will keep this to the end. Some of us have a negative attitude toward the host culture. Uh, and we perceive America is a loose culture. Uh, there is no God in this culture, etc. So I have negative impression about America. But I have actually a very positive impression about Egypt. So that is group is called separationists. Uh, I want to separate myself from the American culture. Uh, so actually the churches will be like an Egyptian island in America. Once you step into a church, you feel yourself as if you travel to Egypt. It's Egyptian island. And when you step outside the church, you return back to America. That's what we call separationists, separations. The opposite to this, when actually we like everything in the American, and actually we are against anything from the Egyptian culture. And some churches actually became very Americanized in everything. And even the line between the holy tradition and the culture is not there. And we are confusing both, just to assimilate everything. And we become Americanized more than the American churches. That's what we call the assimilationists. And some churches actually, uh, they don't know how to be American, and also they don't know how to be Egyptian. So actually, as if they are on the margin of both. That's what we call marginalists. And when you enter the church, you don't know what culture is it. Is it American? Is it Egyptian? It, it, it is something different. It's not neither American nor Egyptian. It's something because they don't know how to actually uh, yani, adapt themselves to the new culture. But the best, actually, model is how to integrate both culture together. And here I'm speaking about culture, not about uh, rituals or about tradition or uh, holy tradition or about uh, dogma and doctrine. I'm speaking just about culture. The best is how to integrate between the best of America and the best of uh, Egypt. And as they say, civilization actually is the integration of two cultures. And if we know how to integrate both cultures together, actually this would be the best uh, model for the church uh, outside their home uh, culture. Only those who reach it to the home stage can be integrationists. But if I'm stuck in the hostility stage, most probably I'll be separationists. If I'm stuck in the human stage, Maybe I'll be assimilationists. But only those who actually reach the home stage will be integrationists. So what is actually assimilations? Uh, when an individual does not wish to maintain his own identity and seek daily interaction with the other culture, when the church actually want to be more Americanized than the American church. They absorb everything, even what's negative. And they are critical to the home culture. 
they joke about the Egyptian and the, the um, Egyptian churches and how they are uh, yani not up to date. Uh, they are not as civilized as these churches. And uh, more, more common among the younger generation and the children of immigrants, they like to assimilate the culture. But in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, St. Paul told us, do not be conformed. Which means, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we need actually to not to be conformed to any culture, neither Egyptian nor American, but to choose from the culture what fits me, as St. Paul said, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12, St. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under any power of any. So here we need the virtue of discernment, discernment to be able to discern what I can take from this culture and what I should not take from this culture. Another verse in First Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verse 21, St. Paul said, test all things, hold fast what is good. Test all things, hold fast what is good. Uh, the separationists, uh, when there is a value placed on holding on to one's original culture, for example, I say, we did it this way in Egypt. In our churches in Egypt, this is the way we do it, and we need to do it this way. Uh, and as, at the same time, I wish to avoid interaction with others from the new culture. So the church will turn into Egyptian island, and we are critical of the host culture, the opposite. The assimilationists, the critical of the home culture, here we are critical of the host culture, and skeptical of anything from the host culture. And these are more common among the others. Marginality, when there is little interest in cultural maintenance or in relation with other groups. So as I, I explained, uh, the church doesn't look like Egyptian or like American. It is something uh, in between. Uh, it is more common among the dissatisfied immigrant and those who are stuck in the hostility stage. The identity is confused and they can have even problem with the law. I, I think the marginality is like what the Lord said in Revelation uh, chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, you are neither cold nor hot. When he said to him, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. You, you have a, an identity, whether this or that. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. But the integration, which actually is the best, when there is interest in maintaining one's original culture in the, uh, and also in daily interaction with the other culture. And this most common among those moved to the home stage. They keep the best of the two cultures. Uh, civilization is the integration of two cultures. And when actually we are integrationists, we contribute to the transformation of both cultures, the home culture as well as the host culture. The best reference in the Bible about integrationists, what St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, from verse 20, when he said, And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. 
to those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. So that is actually the integration, how everybody feels home in the church. Everybody, whether he's American or Egyptian, when he enters the church, he feels home if we are able to integrate both culture together. Also, cultures are different. Uh, some culture, are, we call it individualistic culture, and other culture we call collectivistic culture. What do I mean by this? And, and, and we'll see how to apply this on the church. Indivi individualistic culture, when actually there is a value on the, the individual identity over the group identity. Individual right over group right. Individual needs over group needs. Uh, so it promotes self-sufficiency, individual responsibility, personal autonomy. American culture is perceived as being interested more in the individual than in the group. Uh, but Egypt, uh, an Egyptian perceived that the American culture is individualistic culture. Uh, so here actually individual identity over group identity, individual rights over group rights, individual needs over group needs. Collectivism refers to when we put value on we identity over I identity. Group rights over individual rights group-oriented needs over individual wants and desires. Uh, collectivism promotes relational independence in group harmony, in group collaborative spirit. Uh, so Egyptians perceive their own culture, Egyptian culture, as a collectivist culture. And this culture, actually, if you think about the church, the church actually is integration of both. It is neither individualistic nor collectivistic. But the church actually focus on the group as a whole and the we identity because all of us, we are one body, uh, the body of Christ, but as well as without any negligence to the individual. In the parable of the lost sheep, we saw how the Lord told us this good shepherd left the 99 in order to search for one lost sheep. In Acts chapter 8, there is an amazing story about how in the church, the church should care for the whole group as well as the one individual. Whole group, Acts chapter 8, we read about the ministry of Philip in Samaria. And there was a joy in this city. Everybody accepted Christ. Everybody was baptized by Philip. And even when uh, Peter and John heard in Jerusalem about how Samaria accepted Christ, they sent Peter and John and came and prayed for them and they accepted the Holy Spirit so, and there was a great joy. That's how God cares about the group, a, a, a city. But there was one person returning from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, the Ethiopian eunuch. One person. And the Holy Spirit took Philip after this very successful ministry in Samaria, in order to send him to meet the Ethiopian eunuch, one person, to, to actually lead him to uh, faith in Christ and to believe in Christ. So here, it, we, when we study scripture and we see the ministry in the first church, we can see 
the church should not be individualistic, focusing on the individual only, or focus on the group. But the church should focus on both the group as we are body of Christ, as well as the individual, as we saw in, in many examples, how the Lord went to the Samaritan woman, how the Lord went to the paralytic who was sick for 38 years, Zacchaeus among the group, the Lord actually said to Zacchaeus, today I will be in your house, etc. So here there is emphasis on the person as well as emphasis on the whole group. Another element to understand the culture is what we call power distance dimension. What's power distance dimension? Is how the less powerful member in a culture or in a group accept the power is distributed unequally. For example, in the family, whether the children accept parents are like the hierarchs and children submit to the parents, or the children should have a voice and disagree with the parents and make their own decisions. If we accept difference in power, we call it large power distance culture. If we don't accept difference in power, we call it small power distance culture. And America is a small power distant culture, but Egypt is large power distant culture. So in a small power distant culture like America, children can contradict their parents, speak their own mind. Children are expected to show self-initiative and learn verbal articulateness and persuasion. Parents and, church, uh, and children work toward achieving a democratic family decision-making process. But in large power distant culture, children are expected to obey their parents. Value of respect between an equal status member in the family is taught at young age. That's your dad, that's your mom, that's your grandpa, grandma. You need to respect, you need to submit. Parents and grandparents assume the authority roles in the family decision making process. So here, let's speak about the church. What about the church? Is it the church a small power distance or large power distance? Some people actually from America, they want the church to be a small power distance. And every person's opinion should be taken into consideration. And if the majority, for example, voted, voted for abortion, the church should accept abortion. If the majority voted for uh, same-sex marriage, the church should accept uh, same-sex marriage, etc. And actually other people uh, perceive the church as large power distance. Whatever the Pope says, it will go. Whatever the Bishop says, it should go, whether it is right or wrong. But both are wrong. The church is neither a small power or large power distance. The government in the church is not democratic or dictatorship. The government in the church is not democratic or a dictatorship. The government in the church is, we call it, theocratic. Theo is God. So it is the rule of God in the church. So if me as a, as a bishop, Actually, I made a decision contrary to the teaching of the church, early church fathers, the, the Bible. You know, people should actually say, is this wrong? Because again, it is the, the rule of God in the church. And if the majority of the people voted for something like same-sex marriage, you know, again, we will say, no, it's wrong. Because the Bible said so, because the church fathers said so, because the canon of the church said so. So we should understand if we want to run the church as a small power distant culture, then actually the church will be like, will accept what the culture 
say it is right. So the culture of saying homosexuality is right, we will say it's right. And large power distance, here we're going to in the infallibility of the uh, Pope and infallibility of the Bishop and uh, uh, whatever we say, it's infallible and it, it, it goes without saying. Then that the government in the church is neither small power or large power, but the government in the church is theocratic. Theocratic, the rule of God in the church. Uh, some example about how in the church history there was a conflict between two cultures, like the Judaizers. Uh, in, in, in Galicia, they, they opposed St. Paul. And this made St. Paul say in Galicia chapter 1, even if an angel came from heaven with another doctrine, let him be excommunicated. Also, the tension between two cultures, we can see it in First Corinthians, uh, about uh, should we eat what is offered to the idols or not. When he said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful but for me, but I will not uh, be brought under the power of enemy. Foods are for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both uh, it and them. So here there was a conflict whether we should eat what is offered to the idols or not, and there was a conflict here between two groups. Uh, another uh, conflict uh, when St. Paul went to Athens in Acts chapter 17, and the Stoic and the Hippocrinians uh, actually opposed St. Paul. Uh, and they want to hear about the dogma of the resurrection in Acts chapter 17. Then certain Hippocrinians <coughs> and Stoic philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him to Aristobulus and asked him, you know, we need to know what is this new doctrine, etc. First stage, understanding the culture. You cannot transform something without understanding. So we need to understand the culture. And after understand the culture, second stage is to discern what is right and what's wrong. What is, goes with the will of God, with the perfect, acceptable, holy will of God, perfect will of God, and what's against the acceptable, perfect, uh, holy will of God. So understand, discern, then number three, transform understand the third transfer. So to understand the American culture, we can see three trends here. Humanism. Man is the measure of all things. Man is the highest being. Man is God. As the serpent said to Eve, you shall be like God. Another trend is materialism. Actually, the ultimate goal is to uh, have as much money as you can. Here money is God. And the third trend is hedonism, which actually the pleasure is the highest good. If it feels good, then it is good. Pleasure is God. So we can see here man is God, money is God, and pleasure is God. That's what St. Paul said actually in Second Timothy chapter 3, from verse 1 to 5. He said, but notice that in the last days, 
difficult time will come. For people will be lovers of themselves. Lover of themselves, that is the humanism. Lovers of money, materialism. Lover of pleasure, that is hedonism. Rather than lovers of God. So as if St. Paul foresee, foresaw what is actually going on right now, and he wrote it in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5. And there are some alarming trends here. In theology, religious pluralism. In biology, evolution. In psychology, self-actualization. In ethics, moral relativism. In education, diversity and tolerance. In politics, political collectedness and world government. That's actually what the culture in America is going through. And if we're not aware of these things, this can actually invade the church and can negatively affect uh, the church. So, unfortunately, some people respond to these wrong trends uh, in a wrong way. Some people respond by isolation. So we isolate ourselves from the American culture in order not to be influenced by the American culture. Some people, in order to feel accepted in this culture, they assimilate. Some people, they confront, that's the marginality. But the best, actually, response is transformation. That's what we need. That's our goal, to transform in the grace of God, to transform the culture. And as I said, how to transform culture, understand the saint influence. In First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, we read the son of Yesakar, who had understanding of the times. They understood their times, their culture, to know what Israel ought to do. So when we understand, we need, we will know what to do. I, I will go quickly because each point here, uh, yeah, it needs actually a lot of discussion. But I, I, I will go quickly about some characteristic of the American culture. And I think uh, Abuna Matthias actually, uh, when he started the St. Paul Church, uh, he, he studied the culture and wrote a very, very beautiful paper about some characteristic about the American culture. So I will go through some just points quickly. Uh, here in the American culture, personal control over the environment. We need to be have control over the environment. It's characterized with responsibility. People are responsible. So not everything actually, I'm saying the good, the positive and negative, not everything actually is good and not everything is negative. So there are many good things here. Change seen as natural and positive. Time here is, is very important to this culture. Uh, equality and fairness is very important in this culture. Again, individualism and independence. That's why there are many books about self-help uh, and how, how to be initiative. This culture is a very competitive culture, oriented towards the future, make plan for the future. Action and work orientation. Informality. Yani, you, you, you can see مثلا, how people uh, dress in very, very informal way. And sometimes it comes to the church. Yeah, 50 years ago, there was a, a church code for, for dress. But now, people come to the churches and to, to worship uh, just in, in, in very informal uh, clothes. This culture is very direct culture, open, honest. Uh, for example, if somebody has cancer here, uh, the physician will tell him, you have a few months. In Egypt, if somebody has cancer and terminal, oh, no, 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 you are okay. You can live 50 years. <laughs> so this culture also is uh, focused on practicality and efficiency. Materialism, and as I said, materialism, humanism, and uh, 
hedonism. hedonism. So, second step after understand the culture, discern. And to be able to discern actually is a virtue of those who are spiritually mature. As St. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So, who will be able to transform the culture? Who will be able to discern between what's right and what's good? What should accept in our churches and what we should not accept? Those who are spiritually mature. Uh, then, how to influence the culture, to transform the culture. The Lord said, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven. In Acts 13, 47, the Lord told us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the end of the earth. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the end of the earth. And God gives us many tools to be able to transform the culture, the whole scripture, the church, the church fathers. And we have many biblical examples about people who transform their culture, like Daniel, like Moses, like Noah, like Joseph, like Nehemiah. And actually, uh, in the church history, like Saint Verena, Saint Maurice, how these people actually were able to transform a, a, a whole culture and lead them to uh, the true faith in uh, Christ. Um, so, in conclusion, St. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and who are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. But there is another verse also, inclusion chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive. So either you will take every thought captive, we take every thought captive, or we will be taken captive through philosophy, an empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the principle of the world, rather than according to Christ. So, here is your choice. Either we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we discern what is godly, and what is the holy, acceptable, perfect will of God, and then our church follow this, and the light of the church will shine to the world and transform the culture in which we are, or we run the risk of being taken captive by false philosophies, and our church will assimilate the culture, taking what is right and what is wrong in, 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 in any culture. So I think uh, our goal, transform the world by taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. And on a spiritual, you know, to live here without feeling belonging to this culture and, and, and call this culture a home culture uh, for me. So for some people, just when they feel they are relaxed, uh, that's why they don't need, know there is another stage they need to move to it, which is the home stage. As a second question, I think what you are saying, some people who are integrationists inside the church, they want to keep it all American. Is that what you are saying? Well, I should have clarified. Some people feel that maybe the church doesn't address the individualism part as much as the collectivism. So in, in my kind of understanding, maybe that's the reason why there's outcropping of you know, American Coptic churches, which, like I said, it is very necessary, and I go to them. But, like your grace also mentioned, a byproduct of that is that sometimes they're more American than American. And I'm just kind of wondering how can that start to be resolved? Uh, 
I, I think you're saying in, in, when a church immigrated from Egypt to here, the focus was on the group, the majority, that are the Egyptians without paying attention to the few individuals who are uh, uh, Americans. That's why there was a push toward the American categories. That's what, uh, what I agree with you, but this is our mistake. When actually we, don't, we did not pay attention to the individuals as well as the group, this actually was our mistake. Uh, I, I don't find any excuses here, but what I'm trying to say, uh, the challenges were many at the beginning. You know, besides the, the person themselves, whether they are priests or clergy or bishops or whatever, also they are going through this uh, four stages of adaptation. So how can I care about individuals if I am still like in hostility stage or, or on a human stage? But thank God now actually there is uh, a high awareness uh, of the need of the individual as, uh, as well as the need of the group. But is this the, the, the teaching of the church? I said no. The church should not be just individualistic or uh, collectivist. The church should be both. And I give many examples how actually uh, the apostles, they cared for the Jewish people, Christian from Jewish background, but actually they started to care about the uh, Gentiles, those from uh, not Jewish background. Uh, but even if you go to study the, the, the first church, it started where? It started among the Jews, not among the Gentiles. And when the Jews actually resisted St. Paul, so St. Paul told them, I will go to the Gentiles. Now God will send me to the Gentiles. But at the beginning, even the Lord told them, and you will be uh, witnesses for me in Jerusalem, uh, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of, of the earth. So part of it, it is our mistake, and part of it, it is part of the uh, gradual uh, progress towards serving other culture. It gradual uh, adaptation. It is, as I said, it takes time. It is not overnight. It takes time. Thank you. Okay. Yes. As a second part to that question, now that we see, <laughs> <laughs> um, as a second part to his question, now that we see that we have this dilemma, how do we be careful in that we don't? cross over to the next extreme and become too individual, trying to avoid being too collective? Like, how do we set boundaries to be sure we don't make the opposite mistake? Discernment and understand. As I said, when we understand, maybe if I understand that there is a tendency for a culture to be individualistic or a tendency for a culture to be collectivistic. So now we understand how uh, culture has some tendency. So with un this understanding and with the discernment, uh, then actually we should pay attention to both and to balance. And if uh, one culture is trying to uh, pull us in a certain direction, actually those who are spiritually mature should set the right boundary in order not to, uh, to go into one of these two extremes. Yes. Uh, I just wonder, Sidna, do you think the uh, adaptation depends on the level of education for the individuals? And if the answer is yes, how can we help those who come from Egypt, uneducated, to adapt to this culture? Because then it's very difficult for them. It's easier for an educated person to adapt than the one who's not uh, as educated. Another question. <laughs> Since we created the, the church, the English church, the, the mission church, as you call doesn't that create separation between the two generations? Uh, regarding the first question, uh, the church has a role to educate the people. And when I say to educate, not only just to educate them the language or, or the culture, but uh, to understand themselves and to understand 
what they are going through and to understand that many people actually think that immigration is a visa and a ticket. And once you get the visa and purchase the ticket, then that's it. So a lot of education uh, yeah, has to be done to the newcomers uh, to understand the culture and to make uh, how they move through the four stages of adaptation and acculturation uh, easier. And, and thank God, actually, many churches have uh, committees for the newcomers to teach them uh, ha how to go through these four stages uh, smoothly and to understand uh, the difference between cultures and how to be able not to be assimilationists, not to be separationists, but to be integrationists. Uh, so yes, I agree with you, Th there has to be education to uh, the newcomers. As for your questions, uh, and I know some of you will not like my answer, but I will say it anyway. <laughs> my opinion on my vision, I don't like to have two groups of the churches, churches called America and churches called non-America. Because any church in America should be American church. So I hope that all the churches here will be integrationists. And what actually governs the church is not the culture, but is the law of God. And if we are here in America, then actually we will be American church without forgetting that our roots from Egypt. So keeping this balance that this church grew in Egypt, it started in Egypt, and before Egypt started in Jerusalem, uh, and then uh, now it's in America, so we are uh, adapting to the American culture in a godly way, I think that is what uh, we should be looking for. But now, because the church at the beginning did not pay attention to the Americans, whether the second generation or the converts, that's why there is this uh, movement to have American churches. But to actually uh, separate the church based on the culture, American and non-American, that's actually again the teaching of the scripture. In Christ, there is no uh, Jewish or Greek, there is no barbarian. You know, in heaven, there will not be uh, room for Egyptian, another room for America, another room for Greek. You know, church is multicultural. Heaven is multicultural. So, I hope that one time, uh, uh, very soon, I hope, that our churches will be integrationist churches. I know some of you will have fear, that's why I said some of you will be afraid or don't like what I'm saying, have fear because the dominant uh, un until now is uh, immigrant, so when we say integration of the church, this means the majority will be Egyptian, so now we'll go back to uh, ignoring uh, or uh, neglecting or not paying attention to, to the American. That's why I'm, see, I'm, I'm seeing what's happening right now to have two different churches based on the culture. I see and I pray it will be just a transition. And then uh, all the churches here to be American churches, like American Orthodox Church in, in, here in America, uh, without calling it American, because if I'm in America, it's American church. So, uh, it may take some time, but uh, I hope this uh, will be the future. Maybe Father Sergius would like to say something about this. The hot seat. <laughs> I, get, I like to hear your opinion. I'm not Egyptian. <laughs> I'm, not Egyptian no, it's true. I'm Egyptian by adoption. <laughs> when I come here, I'm Egyptian. We're doing this citizenship. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, thank you, thank you. Well, it's, a, it's such a big question, and I find it, what I find fascinating is, you know, I'm, I'm a priest in the Orthodox Church of America, and many of these discussions that, that are, you're having right now in the Coptic Church um, were probably very, very prominent in, in our churches, let's say, in the 1950s. 
in the 1960s uh, when, when they were grappling. These were uh, either first generation or re relatively recent uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe. And they were grappling, well, how can we do this? How can we, how can we be here in America? How can we be a witness to Christ in the Orthodox Church without losing uh, the ways of our fathers, without losing you know, our holy traditions? Um, and uh, what can I say? I think the... I think your image of, of, a, of, of a woman giving birth to a child is a very good one because anyone who's ever been present or at, at, any man who's been present at a birth or any woman who's given birth know it is, it is, it is hard, <laughs> right? It is hard and it's painful. Um, and not only are there the nine months of, of pregnancy, which are also difficult, but the actual giving birth, right, is so difficult. And, um, but yet God is merciful uh, and at the end, well, what is um, what is our is it our Lord who says you know after the I'm, I'm misquoting but somewhere in Scripture uh, it's we're told that you know no Christ says it that after the child is born there's much rejoicing exactly. and you don't remember all the pain right you and, and simply you give jo you, you rejoice because a new child has been born um, and so I guess what I would say is that the most critical aspect is is with everything that you all the wonderful uh, exhibition and examination of culture and different facets and so forth um, to simply stay focused on Christ and on the love of Christ and the love of neighbor so that whatever decision is made and like you said sometimes we'll make mistakes right but ultimately if we make those mistakes or if we, if we make the right choices if we're doing it in a with a, with a firm conviction uh, to love Christ to love our neighbor that would be the neighbor who's been in the parish with me for 25 years uh, who moved over from the same village, or whether that's the neighbor who lives down the street who's never been in the church before. Uh, as long as those decisions are made, uh, I think, um, with a firm conviction to, to follow Christ's commandment, to love God and to love the neighbor, then even when we make mistakes, um, we'll be able to ask for forgiveness um, and we'll be able to move on uh, because we know God is merciful. Um, and that's also important, too, is that when we do make mistakes, we ask forgiveness of one another. You know, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, but maybe we didn't make the right choice then. That's okay. We can repent, right? Metanoia, we can retake aim again. So um, I have the greatest respect for the, for the discussion you're having um, and the honesty with which you're approaching it. Um, I don't think I have any good answer or cl clean answer because there isn't, it's like childbirth, right? <laughs> there, there's no good, clean, like, what's the easiest way to have, ch have a child? Uh, I, there is no easy way. Um, nothing that's truly valuable um, has an easy way, right? Uh, salvation, it only comes uh, right through the cross, right? Uh, through that willingness to offer yourself. So, so God bless you in this journey. <laughs> and if I can, I mean, I, I, I feel like I just rambled. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but thank you for putting me on the hot seat. Thanks, Brother Finn. Here's what I want to say. I want to say it now. I just wanted to share, I mean, something that I experienced at St. Paul in Houston um, that I didn't expect, um, but I understand kind of where, where it's coming from now. So when we started, we started to find uh, many people coming to the church that were not attending the church at all. I mean, maybe they were Coptic and they were been in the church since they were born very, from a very young age, but for various reasons throughout their life, uh, they left the church and hadn't really been attending church, or even if they did, they would maybe attend church once or twice a year, um, whereas now they're, thank God, attending on a weekly basis. And a big demographic uh, of the people that I find in the church are those people who are divorced. And they say the reason why they come to St. Paul is because there's no judgment. They don't feel from the other members of the congregation that they are looked down on or that they are seen as somehow less or that they've done something wrong or they're sinners that have not repented. Um, and so we find many people uh, who come who are single parents and with their children and so on. And even though this wasn't designed or engineered to be this way, it's not like we thought in our mind, oh, we have to make the church open and welcoming to divorced people. Um, but that's in fact what's happened and we still preach against divorce and we say divorce is wrong and this is not God's plan So it's not like we're accepting the idea of divorce, but at the same time the people who come um, for, for, for maybe primarily social reasons they feel comfortable to come that people are not going to speak against them and so on So when I began to see this I really felt like even though in the church it's, it's not about the name It's not about that. It's called American Coptic or not but certainly having designated such a church as being one that would attract people of American culture, not because this group of people is more Christ-like, not because the group of American 
you know, people that are coming to the church are more loving, but simply because of an American culture, divorce is not as uh, as strange or as rare or as look, you know, as taboo perhaps as um, in Egypt. That we all grew up with the understanding that divorce happens, and we have friends who are divorced or have children who are, you know, parents that are divorced and so on. So we don't we don't react to it maybe necessarily in a very shocked way or in a way to ostracize uh, these people. So, like your base said earlier, um, that culture is just something you absorb. It, it's it's not necessarily something you you just keep in your mind. So, in that regard, uh, I feel the, the the idea of having the American Coptic churches has been beneficial, not just because we pray liturgy in English or, or so on, and not because we try to serve American food or because we try to promote American things in a kind of artificial way, but simply because of the attitudes that some people come with. And, and again, it's not because Americans are more Christ-like. It's just, it's just a difference of culture that has indirectly and without, and without, you know, without foreknowledge caused this environment to be a place where these people who had never attending church before feel comfortable to come and to attend. So my question to your grace is, having created such an environment, how would we then integrate people who are of a different attitude? And, and, and how long would that process take? I mean, I totally agree that at some point when people enter to the home stage, maybe they could start to, to, to feel that way or to to you know, think to themselves, maybe, maybe because of being a focus on being Christ-like, saying because I, we want to be Christ-like, we do not want to judge others. But certainly, that's much more difficult and takes much more time for people of a culture where divorce is just seen as something very difficult to accept as as happening in the society. Um, so, so how would how would we integrate such a thing together um, when you have people coming from very different backgrounds like that? I think you answered the question. Speaking about the Egyptian culture, is it Christian to be judgmental? It's not Christian. Uh, so actually, this culture has to be transformed. And part of the transformation of this culture is to know that being judgmental of others is a sin and needs repentance and needs forgiveness. So actually, uh, we, when we deal with the Egyptian culture, we should actually focus on how not to be judgmental, how to repent of the sin, how to be able to open the door as the Lord opened the door to the Samaritan woman, to open the door to the uh, Zacchaeus, to, to, to many people who were called by their culture sinners, but Christ actually accepted them. So uh, I think the integration here happens. What integration means? We need to do just the transformation in ourselves in order so we see here the American culture is a non-judgmental culture maybe the Egyptian culture is a judgmental culture so the integration when the Egyptian culture turned to be a non-judgmental culture why not because we assimilate a culture but this is the teaching of of Christ usually in um, the Sunday of Samaritan woman uh, I start my sermon like this uh, a newcomer moved to our church here, and here is her history. She was the, the divorced five times before, and now she is living with a person who is not her, uh, her husband. What's your reaction to this lady who came to our church? You know, just when he puts a person on the spot to ask himself, in, in our time, if a person joined our church, was divorced five times, and living with a boyfriend, and now she came to the church. How are we going to look at her? I think when I put myself in this situation and think about it, and then I compare what I, I, I will be doing with what Christ did with her, this, oh, <laughs> that's a sin. I'm not aware of it. You know? And the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was a non-judgmental with her and, and showed her love and did not uh, and show compassion on her, he was able actually to lead her to, to repentance. So the integration, you have to answer the question, this should be transformed in uh, the Egyptian culture, how in our teaching, in our preaching, in, in, in our ministry, how to, to help the people to be non judgmental, uh, to judge the sin, but to love the sinners, as we say. And who among us is not sinner? All of us who are sinners.
Um, as, I, as I mentioned to you, Your Grace, a couple of weeks ago, that I, I personally believe, um, you know, and I have the privilege of serving youth uh, here and in Egypt as well, is that the, the problem I see is the, um, is the problem of apathy when it comes to youth wanting to be uh, involved in the church ministries and so on and so forth. And in apathy, as you mentioned, Your Grace, the, it makes God sick to his stomach because he would want to vomit the apathetic out. So um, now the cause, I believe, of this, prop, of this problem um, is um, relevance. And as, as I, again, I mentioned this to you a couple of weeks ago, I, um, I, and I love your vision of how we ought to further integrate with the culture so that we become relevant, so the youth can attend a church that can speak their language, uh, think with the same mindset, so I feel that I can relate to this church. Any other suggestions bef besides the, what you, your Grace mentioned, integration, simulation, and all of that? Any other suggestions on how we can become more relevant to the youth so that we can overcome that epidemic of apathy? I think this question needs a, a lot of study and, and research and understanding why our youth are apathetic um, and what are the underlying issues uh, underneath it in order to be able to uh, uh, stir the zeal uh, and, 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 um, and the relevancy will, will return back uh, to them, but I think again, it is about our uh, yeah, spiritual life and our personal uh, relationship with Christ. Yeah, if if we focus on how to plant this youth in the church and plant ourselves also, so we 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 be we have the zeal, we have the the, the person a strong relationship with Christ. And as Father Sergius said, you know, love God and love your neighbor. Uh, when just we, we, we obey the commandment and we live with Christ, actually it, it, uh, the apathy will be gone and uh, the, the relevance that you are speaking about uh, yani will, will return the back. But again, it needs a lot of uh, understanding first what are the reasons that made our youth uh, apathetic. Uh, is it because of the influence of the culture? Is it because of the influence of the philosophy? Is it because they are taking captives to uh, philosophies and ideologies that, that are wrong? That's why uh, they lost this uh, zeal. What is the reason behind it? And, and I think that's a big, big question. I need to 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 be studied, uh, served. Uh, in order to be able to to have a plan how to address this in our ministry. So even your um, a slide about integrate, uh, integration was, it said, um, one of the points said, maintain one's own culture while continuously dealing with others. Um, how important and critical do you think it is to maintain your own culture as you are going through that process of adapting and of um, integrating with, with the culture, and not only on an individual level, but also on the church. Because if we're saying we need to keep one's own culture, um, then we are, and if we put that in the church, then we need to, the church to still look like the Egyptian culture. Are we only talking about the positives in the culture? Absolutely, or absolutely, for example, any culture has positive and has negatives. Like uh, Bona Mathias when he spoke about how the American culture are an unjudgmental culture, you know? Uh, so one of the weaknesses of the Egyptian culture is judgment. So we will not take this from the Egyptian culture. But I can say the opposite. For example, in, in, in the Egyptian culture, uh, cultures that respect uh, parents, respect uh, uh, clergy, respect the church, uh, I don't see here the same level 
uh, you know, of, of, of respect, like toward parents or toward uh, church or church reason. For example, uh, in my own family, uh, never ever a bishop visited us in, in my family. And actually, when a priest used to visit us, it was like a feast, a big celebration. Everyone is happy and everyone is preparing for this visit. Uh, uh, you know, we are ve very happy. Uh, here, for example, in America, when I visit uh, people, and then come say hi to Sayyid. Okay, hi. <laughs> 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 you know? So I, I, I'm surprised, you know. And it has nothing to do with the spirituality. Yani, in Egypt, when, you know, a priest visit even a church never goes to the church. You know, everybody is happy around Abuna, trying to ask a question, learn. You know, so that's what I'm saying. If there is something in the in the Egyptian culture, good, we need to keep it. You know, don't reject everything from the Egyptian culture, and also we need to integrate what's in the American culture, and 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 we reject what is negative from both culture, but we keep what's positive in both culture. And in this way, as they say, uh, civilization is the integration of two cultures. So it will be the best uh, if we integrate uh, the best of the two cultures. Thank you so much. Glory be to God forever and ever.